In this lecture, we're going to look at the earliest gospel, at least according to historians. And I've given you a couple handouts, uh, which you can find online on the e-learning website uh, regarding the authorship of Mark and also the dating of Mark uh, to read more about this. But this is the earliest gospel according to modern historians. Modern historians started to think a couple hundred years ago that Mark is the first gospel that was written. Part of the reason they think that, and this will make more sense when we get to Matthew and when we get to Luke, is because it looks like Matthew and Luke are both copying Mark. Uh, in fact, something like 70, 75% of the Gospel of Mark, sometimes word for word, shows up in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke. Now, we'll talk about that more when we get to the Gospel of Matthew. But if you're a historian, this is really important because you would say, well, if this is the earliest text, I want to pay attention to it because earlier texts, you assume as a historian, uh, might be less tainted because there hasn't been enough time for these texts to be edited. Uh, the, the, the further and further and further you get away from the earliest text, the more editing you have, the more cleaning up you have, all that sort of stuff. Now, this was not the case in the early church. So in the 2nd century, the 3rd century, 4th, 5th century, people thought Mark was actually a Cliff Notes version of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, people of, of power in the early church simply thought Mark just gave us a, a truncated version of Matthew, so why bother reading it? And uh, for a long time, people paid very, very little attention to Mark because they thought it was just a scaled down version of Matthew. But that changed a couple hundred years ago uh, in modern European scholarship. And it's something that uh, all New Testament scholars today, for the most part, uh, take for granted is that the gospel of Mark comes first. Now, the technical term for this, and you don't need to worry about this, is, is Markan priority, which means Mark is the first gospel. Uh, you spell that, by the way, M-A-R-K-A-N, priority. Well, before we get into Mark, uh, this is a perfect opportunity to say that Mark really tells you that these gospels are not modern biographies. And, and why I say this is, if you've read Mark, or when you read it, one of the first things you're going to realize is, there is nothing in the Gospel of Mark about Jesus' birth. There's little to nothing about his family. There's nothing about his teenage years, even his 20s. What, what happens is you suddenly meet Jesus when he's an adult in his 30s. All the rest just seems to be kind of irrelevant to Mark. Now, some have tried to argue there's an introduction to Mark that's missing, but that really doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, it's just the, the early life of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, wasn't interesting to some followers of Jesus in the ancient world. Now, uh, the fact that Mark says very, very little about Jesus' parents, there, there, there is one episode we will talk about because it's an important episode uh, that involves Jesus' brothers and sisters and his mom. Uh, but the fact that Mark doesn't say much about his parents is important because that changes when we get to Matthew and we get to Luke. Basically, anything anybody tells you about Jesus' father, Joseph, Jesus' mother, Mary, that's coming out only of Matthew and Luke. Uh, again, Mark just doesn't care about this stuff. Uh, in fact, there are other Christian writers like Paul, who in his letters says very, very little about Jesus' parents and his upbringing. In fact, Paul all he ever says is Jesus was born of a woman, uh, never says who she is. So obviously uh, the birth of Jesus was not that important to all Christians. It was important to some early followers of Jesus, but not to all. Now, that all of that right away should say, okay, this is not a modern biography because a modern biography would be interested in all of that stuff. Who are his parents? Uh, who are these brothers and sisters of his? The other thing is, modern biography, and I, I don't know if you've ever realized this, but one of the characteristics of modern biography is that it gets into the basic character and psychology of that character 
or, or individual. Now, psychology obviously didn't exist 2,000 years ago in Israel-Palestine, but uh, in, in fact, psychology isn't that, that big of a thing in, in the modern Middle East, just because it's a very, very different culture from Western culture, from European culture and American culture. But one thing modern biographies typically tend to do is try to create a psychological profile of the person they're studying, the character they're studying. Uh, Mark just doesn't do this. It, it, it isn't of any interest to him. In fact, when you read Mark, it, you never have Mark talking about what Jesus is thinking. In fact, n none of the Gospels do this. Uh, you, you never have them trying to get into the inner psyche of Jesus. So again, this is why modern scholars will say the Gospels, it, the closest thing they fit in the ancient world is this thing called ancient bios, B-I-O-S literature. You can see it there in my notes. Uh, things like Suetonius's Lives of the Caesars, Plutarch's Greek Lives and Roman Lives. If you're writing about famous people in the ancient world, uh, you're, you're not interested in getting into the psyche of that character or what that character thinks. That's something we are interested in as modernists who, who care about that stuff. Uh, and again, a lot of ancient bios literature doesn't really care where the character came from. The point of it is to communicate a broader message about values and morality and things like that. Well, turning to Mark, I, I want to start by saying that long ago, a couple hundred years ago, a German scholar said this about Mark. He said, Mark is a passion narrative with an extended introduction. And that's a pretty good way of describing Mark. In fact, that, that description of Mark still holds up and, and scholars still often say this about Mark. This phrase, passion narrative, in fact, if you uh, go down south in Tennessee and places like that, you'll often see passion plays being put on throughout the year, especially around Easter time. This word passion comes from the Latin passio, P-A-S-S-I-O. That word in Latin means to suffer. In fact, the, the actual meaning of passion, we don't necessarily use it this way, is to suffer. But anybody who's been passionately in love knows that sometimes that can be great and sometimes it can be painful and it, and it can feel like absolute suffering on the part of the person who's madly in love. So a passion narrative is the suffering narrative part of Jesus' life. It's his trial. It's his death. It's his crucifixion. All that sort of stuff. So what this German scholar is saying is Mark is basically a suffering narrative, a passion narrative that just happens to have a really long introduction attached to it. Uh, and, and really, what Mark is trying to do is get you to that passion narrative. So, the other thing this tells us, and this is a key thing about Mark, is that the story of Mark is a story of tragedy. In fact, some scholars have thought Mark is, is really almost telling the story of Jesus as if it's Greek tragedy. But another way you might look at this, or we might look at this, is Mark is really a story about suffering. And if anybody ever asked you, what is the main theme of Mark? Uh, it's the suffering of Jesus. And it's, if you're going to follow Jesus, well, to follow Jesus is to suffer. Now, Mark is the shortest gospel in the New Testament. Uh, it's only 16 chapters. And in fact, uh, the ending of Mark, there's two uh, there, there's additional endings that have been added to Mark over time to try and make sense out of something that has disturbed people about the original ending of Mark, which we'll talk about later on. But it is the shortest gospel. And when you read it, it it's almost anxiety provoking because it just moves really, really quickly. This happens, then this happens, then this happens. In fact, one of Mark's favorite words is immediately. So the, the action's very rapid. It's just boom, 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 boom. Everything is happening so quickly. Jesus does this, then he does that, then he does this, then he does that. 
And like I said, it, it's, it's only 16 chapters long. But a third of it, in all of this rapid-fire storytelling, has to do with what happened during the last seven days of his life. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this isn't true of John, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke suggest that they're only telling us one year in the life of Jesus. So we're getting a one-year slice in Matthew, Mark, Luke of the, of the life of Jesus, of the adult Jesus. And in Mark, even though it's 16 chapters, a third of it has to do with the last seven days of that year. Now, fortunately with Mark, and this isn't true of all the other Gospels, but fortunately with Mark, Mark tells us what he's trying to do as a writer right from the very beginning of his Gospel. In fact, in the very first chapter of Mark, in the very first verse, so chapter 1, verse 1, Mark gives us his thesis statement. This is what he wants you to understand about Jesus. This is what he wants the hearer, the reader of his text, to understand. And he says this, The beginning of the good news, that word good news is also the word gospel, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Another way of translating this is the beginning of the good news, the gospel of Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Basically, what Mark is telling you right from the very opening is that what I want you to get from my writing, this text, is there's this guy, Jesus, and he's one, the Messiah, two, the Son of God. So he starts out by saying this is the gospel uh, in my notes, I've given you a transliteration of the Greek word. It's pronounced euangelion. Uh, it can mean gospel or it can mean good news. Uh, euangelion is a Greek word that was often used in the Roman world to uh, refer to the coming of an emperor to a city uh, in the Roman Empire. It was good news if uh, a Roman emperor was going to show up in your city. You celebrated that. So what Mark is saying is, look, here, here's the good news. There's this guy, Jesus, and he's the Messiah, and he's the Son of God. Now, that's what Mark wants you to know. But, but the question here is, well, what does that mean? That's the answer. So if, so if you asked Mark that Christological question, who is Jesus? Mark's answer is, he's the Messiah and the Son of God. But Mark's going to spend 16 chapters trying to explain to you why that's important, and what that means. Now, the outline of Mark is, is fairly simple. Uh, and I've given you that outline in my notes, but just to go over it here briefly. Uh, after you get the thesis statement, chapter 1, verse 2, all the way to chapter 1, verse 13, gives you this very brief, and I mean very brief, introduction to Jesus. It's a much shorter introduction than anything you get in Matthew or in Luke or in John. And then starting in chapter 1, verse 14 to chapter 9, verse 50, you get all these stories which cover the Galilean ministry of Jesus. And what you get are these stories about Jesus healing people, Jesus exercising demons out of people, Jesus teaching miracles that Jesus is performing, and you hear all these stories about Jesus' travels throughout the Galilean region. And then finally, you hit that passion narrative. You hit chapters 11 through 15, which are about the very last week of Jesus' life, that, that, that suffering narrative. And then in chapter 16, verses 1 through 8, where Mark actually ends, you get rumors and we'll have to come back to this, possible rumors about his resurrection. You hear about female disciples of Jesus, and yes, there were female followers of Jesus. That's clear from all of the Gospels. 
who go to his tomb. They find the tomb empty, and all we're told is they were afraid and they ran away. This is not the clearest way to end a gospel or a book. It's certainly a weird way to end a book because it's filled with ambiguity. Now, most people, when they read Mark, go, well, of course it's clear what happened at the end of this book, but people think that because they've read Matthew, they've read Luke, and they've read John. But remember, if you're a good historian, you have to act like, well, what if I didn't have access to other texts about Jesus or other traditions about Jesus? What if all I had 2,000 years ago was Mark? What if the only thing I'd heard was Mark? And of course, there's these longer endings. I'll, I'll get to that later. It really has nothing to do with Mark. It actually has something to do more with um, something that's occurred in modern American Christianity. But we'll, we'll come back to that. But there are these longer endings. And the New Oxford Annotated Bible tries to make this very clear to you by putting these endings in brackets and saying, look, th this is not part of the original text of Mark. Well, let's talk about Mark for, for a minute. Who, who is Mark? Well, modern historians have absolutely no idea who Mark is. And again, like I said, I, I've, I've given you some material that, that explains this in more detail, so I don't have to go into it here in the lecture. But traditionally, uh, early Christians associated the Gospel of Mark with a man named John Mark. John Mark in early Christian tradition was thought to be the personal private secretary of Jesus's disciple, Peter. Now, the problem with this is it's a tradition that doesn't seem to exist until somewhat late in the second century, uh, which means we don't have evidence to verify it uh, going back to the first century. What modern historians think is that all of these Gospels uh, were originally anonymous. The authors of these Gospels didn't want people to know who they were for one reason or another. And in fact, when you, when you read the text of Mark, you realize this, that the author never says, my name is Mark. This is who I am. You see the same thing with Matthew. You see the same thing with Luke. You see the same thing with John. All of the original New Testament documents are written in Greek. So Mark, whoever that was, is a follower of Jesus early on who knows Greek. So that means he's... he's a Greek-speaking follower of Jesus. It also means he's literate. He's part of that 10% that knows how to read and write. Uh, if, you know, if, if you ever learn Hellenistic Greek or New Testament Greek, you discover pretty quickly that even though Mark knows Greek, his Greek isn't that good, especially when compared to Matthew and especially when compared to Luke. Um, so you have this Greek speaking follower of Jesus that, uh, as far as historians are concerned is, is anonymous who never says who they are. It's also difficult to pinpoint the audience of Mark. Most of the gospels are written to communities of followers of Jesus. They're written to a group of individuals that, are following Jesus, are, are Christ followers, Jesus followers. It's, it, it, with, with Matthew, Matthew leaves you some clues to try and figure out uh, things about his audience, things about his community. John does the same thing. Mark, not so much. Um, historians think that the audience was probably a male audience because typically an audience hearing one of these Gospels 2,000 years ago would have been a male audience. And this is a perfect time for me to remind you, um, if you didn't pick up on this in the article in the New Oxford Annotated Bible, that uh, since most people can't read, they, they wouldn't have been reading this thing we call the Gospel of Mark. They would have listened to somebody else reading it to them. So in the ancient world, you wouldn't have been a reader of the Gospel of Mark. You would have been a hearer of the Gospel of Mark. 
so all we can really say is that here's Mark, whoever it is, who's a Greek speaking follower of Jesus, writing a text probably to a male audience that's that's hearing this text that uh, are likely also Greek speaking followers of Jesus. Usually we date the Gospel of Mark to the year 70 CE, the same year that the Jewish temple was destroyed by the Romans. And part of this I'll come back to, but part of why we do that is because of something that occurs in Mark chapter 13. Uh, there are some allusions in Mark chapter 13 to uh, the destruction of the temple by the Romans. Uh, so it looks as if Mark knows uh, that uh, this event has already taken place. Now, if we're just looking at Mark's Jesus, Mark gives us an interpretation, as all the gospel writers do, of, of what he thinks about Jesus. The gospel writers are, are reconstructing Jesus for us. They're giving us their, their own personal constructions of Jesus, just like every writer does. This is this is one of the, the things that when you study any primary sources from the ancient world or even going back a couple hundred years, any, anybody who writes stuff always writes from their own perspective. And that's true with Mark. It's true with Matthew, Luke, John. Well, our first temptation, because we have Matthew and we have Luke and we have John and we have all these other books in the New Testament, is for us to try and solve any problems we encounter in Mark by harmonizing the Gospel of Mark with the other Gospels or with other texts in the New Testament. Now, if you're playing the role of historian, you have to take yourself back to the first century and say, yeah, the problem with that is people in the first century didn't have the 27 books of the New Testament that we have today. Uh, like I've already said, they, they may only have had Mark. It's possible they only had a couple letters of Paul or only had heard a couple letters of, of Paul. So one of the things we have to do, and we're going to have to do this again with Matthew and again with Luke and again with John, is we have to ask ourselves, what would we think about Jesus if we only had the Gospel of Mark? If that's all we had ever heard, what kind of Christianity, quote unquote, would, would we come up with? What kind of Jesus would we come up with? Well, before we go too deeply into the Gospel of Mark, we need to talk about what perhaps is one of the biggest issues in Markan scholarship. And this is something called the Messianic Secret. And this is really one of the big problems in the Gospel of Mark. Let me give you an example of what this is. In chapter 1, verse 25, uh, Jesus is exercising a demon out of a, a man who has... Uh, who's possessed. And after he does that, uh, Jesus is actually speaking to this demon, and uh, this demon says, yeah, I know who you are. And then Jesus rebukes this demon, and he says, be silent. And then the unclean spirit comes out of this individual. Uh, we see the same thing later on in this chapter in chapter 1, verses uh, 43 through 44, where Jesus is healing a, a man with leprosy. After sternly warning him, he sent him away at once. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and uh, offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now, there, there are a bunch of examples of this. And to be completely honest, this is something that's baffling all throughout the Gospel of Mark. Basically what I'm getting at here, what scholars have noticed for, for a long time, 
is this basic question. Why does Jesus keep telling people to remain silent about who he is after he's taken a demon out of them or after he's healed them? In other words, why, why does Jesus tell people that, that or characters in this gospel who, who get, hey, you're the Messiah, you're the Son of God, why does he tell them to be silent about this? Well, several centuries ago, um, there was a German scholar named William Vrede. That, that W is pronounced like a V in German. And he came up with this whole concept called the Messianic Secret. Now, nobody... Uh, follows this in the way Vrede uh, uh, once framed it. But Vrede actually thought what Mark was doing is that Mark had invented this literary device and that Mark uh, was having Jesus say stuff like this on purpose. And what Vrede's theory was is that Mark knew as an author whoever Mark was, that during his lifetime, Jesus never said he was the Messiah and never said he was the Son of God. So Mark invents this literary technique in which anybody who says Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God, well, you have Jesus telling them, be silent about that, to reflect the fact that Mark knows Jesus never said this. Uh, in fact, what Vrede is saying is the claim that Jesus is the Messiah, the claim that Jesus is the Son of God, all of that comes from Jesus' earliest followers. It, it comes after he dies, when his followers rethink who Jesus is. So based on this whole older theory, Mark, in a sense, is protecting Jesus. Now, I mean, Vredi's right that something is going on here, but it's not that. Uh, there's a lot of problems with this theory because uh, even though Jesus tells people in Mark to be silent, it's, it almost acts like what we would call reverse psychology. Because he's saying people go off and, and, and they tell people who he is anyway. It's almost as if you, you wonder if Jesus is doing this on purpose. Don't tell anybody so they go and do it. Um, if you pay really close attention to Mark, it doesn't matter if Jesus tells people not to talk about who he is because his fame just keeps spreading anyway. And then there's this story in chapter 5. Verses 19 through 20. Uh, in which Jesus is healing the uh, Gerasene demoniac. But Jesus refused and said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and he began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. So, so there is a story in, right in the Gospel of Mark in which Jesus actually does tell somebody he's healed, Yeah, go tell everybody what I did for you, which seems to go entirely in the face of what Vrede was saying. So Freddy's theory doesn't work, but, but something he was on to is uh, there is a theme in Mark of misunderstandings, plural. There's, there's this whole literary thing going on in Mark of people not understanding who Jesus is, or at least misunderstanding it. And, and really kind of the impression you get is the people that should know who he is don't know. And then the people that uh, shouldn't know or characters that shouldn't know do know. Uh, this all seems to be working in an opposite way in Mark. Uh, so to give you an example of this, um, here's Jesus in Mark chapter 4. We won't bother looking at the whole story, but he uh, uh, is... Uh, calming the storm or stilling the storm and he's with his disciples and they witness this whole event of Jesus miraculously stopping a storm while they're on a boat uh, and then in verse 41 we read and they were filled with great awe and they said to one another 
Who is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. So these are Jesus' followers, his disciples, and they just watched him calm a storm that was about to kill them or something like that or destroy their boat, and they don't get it. And you would think... Uh, his, his immediate followers, his disciples, would know who he is. We see this as well in Matthew or Mark chapter 6, where uh, Jesus uh, has before this, the two stories before this is Jesus has miraculously fed 5,000 people. Then uh, the disciples wa watch Jesus walk on the water, a very famous story. Um, and then in uh, verse 51, then Jesus got into boat, the boat with them and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded for they didn't understand about the loaves. And their hearts were hardened. So they, they've watched Jesus perform these, these miracles with food. They've watched Jesus walk on water. And, and they don't know who he is. Uh, in fact, th th there's a point where Jesus gets really upset with one of his disciples. And it's not because the disciple doesn't get the answer right. The, the disciple doesn't know the meaning of the answer. If you look at... Uh, Mark chapter 8. Uh, starting at verse 27. This is uh, where you get the whole question of Christology. Who do you say that I am? Jesus went with his disciples, went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And then again, you see this, this very strange thing. He sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Well, the very next part of this Jesus starts to explain what it means to be the Messiah. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, but turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan! For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. So even when Peter starts to get it right, one of his disciples comes up with the right answer, there's still misunderstanding about what that answer means. If you look at the very last words of Jesus at the end of Mark's Gospel, these very, very tragic words that are, are a quote from Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's this whole sense in the Gospel of Mark, all throughout it, that everyone seems to be turning their backs on Jesus and just not understand, and they just don't seem to understand who he is. Especially those people who should know better, like his disciples. Now, ironically, there are people who do get it. Some of these individuals make sense, some don't. We, obviously, as readers of this gospel or hearers, we get it because Mark told us in the very first sentence who Jesus is. He's the Messiah, and he's the Son of God. But what's going on with everybody else? In fact, one, one of the most puzzling things, and then I'll give you, give you a list here, a summary of who gets it, who doesn't get it. One of the most puzzling things occurs in Mark 15. Uh, 
verse 39. A Roman soldier, a Roman centurion that, that likely nailed Jesus to the cross, says this. Now, now, when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last breath, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. Now, again, Frede was was wrong in his messianic secret hypothesis, but something is going on here that 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 is is obviously something that's that's a literary motif, a literary device that Mark has created, and it, it it's it's kind of confusing. In fact, you you go to the next chapter, and the entire gospel, as I've already pointed out, it it ends in complete total confusion and silence. These these women come to the tomb. They don't understand what, what, what's happened. They, they're afraid, and they run away. So the women at the tomb don't seem to understand that there's this thing called the resurrection. All right, well, to, to sum up a few things here, here's who knows what's going on. First of all, the reader of the gospel knows, the hearer of the gospel knows. Because Mark tells us in chapter 1, verse 1, here's Jesus. You assume whoever Mark is that Mark knows since he's writing this thing. God seems to know uh, because of what this voice from heaven says at uh, Jesus' baptism. We, we assume Jesus knows. The supernatural seems to know, especially these demons that Jesus encounters, that they often blurt out who he is, and, and Jesus has to tell them, he has to rebuke them and say, look, you, you need to shut up and remain silent. And then the people he heals knows. What's strange on this is that the Jewish religious leaders have no idea who Jesus is. In fact, early on in Mark's gospel, if you picked up on this, they think he's possessed. They think that's why he's able to heal people. They think that's why he's able to cast out demons. It's because he's possessed. His disciples don't get it. They waffle all over the place. If you pay really close attention to the Gospel of Mark, his family members don't get it. They seem to think he's lost his mind. And then his neighbors, his, his, the, the people he grew up with, in his hometown, don't know who he is. Well, there's this critical turning point in the Gospel of Mark that a number of scholars have said, basically about halfway through Mark, an event takes place that's symbolic, and it's a metaphor of that, that, that basically says, okay, from here on out, people are going to start slowly getting it, slowly seeing it. Now, there are a number of ways to, to, to solving um, all of these misunderstanding of problems in Mark, but I, I'm going I'm to tell you the, the most popular one and my favorite one, which I think makes the most sense here. Uh, but th there are other interpretations, and it doesn't mean that there's one right interpretation to this. A turning point happens in the Gospel of Mark uh, in chapter 8. There is a story in Mark chapter 8, right before Peter declares, you're the Messiah. There, there is a story, a short story that starts in verse 22 and goes to verse 26 about Jesus healing a blind man at Bethsaida. And you have to pay really close attention to this story because there's something problematic about this story. But Mark seems to be using this story as a metaphor for something. They came to Bethsaida, Mark says. Some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva in his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. 
Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Then he sent him away to his home, saying, and here's that motif again, do not even go into the village. So he's saying, don't tell anyone. Now, part of what bothers people about this story in Mark, and you may not have picked up on it, is that Jesus has to heal this blind man twice before it works. When he heals him the first time, he starts to partially see. When he heals him the second time, he can see everything. Now, when, when Matthew gets a hold of this story, when Luke gets a hold of this story, they're a bit embarrassed by this because you can't have the Messiah and the Son of God needing to heal a person twice because it says something negative about his power. So scholars think that, that, that work specifically on Mark, and I think this makes the most sense, that Mark has Jesus heal this man twice on purpose. The metaphor here is that, like the blind man, people are going to start gradually seeing, maybe not 100%, but gradually seeing who Jesus is. They may not get it 100%. It may take a couple of times till they get it, but they're going to start gradually getting it. And this is kind of exactly what happens next. Peter blurts out, you're the Messiah. Well, you keep reading, and then he gets all of that wrong. Um, but, th but this really seems to be the story of the blind man. This is the midpoint of the gospel. And this leads to that question of, who am I? Who do you say that I am? That whole Christological question of, who is Jesus? Now, to, to be fair for a second to Peter and uh, to all of Jesus' other Jewish disciples, part of the problem Peter is having is a problem that any good Jew in the ancient world would have had. There is no concept in ancient Judaism, in Second Temple Judaism, of a Messiah who dies and rises from the dead. If you die as a Messiah, you are a failed Messiah. You don't win as a Messiah, as a Jewish Messiah. You don't win by suffering. You win by conquering. You win by being Judas Maccabeus, Mattathias. You, you, you win by overthrowing the enemies of the Jewish people, not by getting killed by them. So, it, it, I mean, it kind of makes sense. Peter just doesn't get this. No Jew would get this in the ancient world. What, what do you mean you have to suffer and die? That's ridiculous. What early followers of Jesus had to do is they had to go back to the Hebrew Bible. They had to go back to the Old Testament and try to find some sort of rationale for this. And what they did is they went to Isaiah chapter 53, to the prophet Isaiah chapter 53. You can look it up on your own. And they read this story about the suffering servant in Isaiah. Now, historically, the suffering servant is either Isaiah as a prophet or it's the people of Israel. But early Christians reread it as, no, the, the, the suffering servant is Jesus. The suffering servant is the suffering Messiah. And the way that Mark is retelling the story of Jesus is largely based on this Isaiah 53 passage that the suffering servant is the suffering Messiah, which is Jesus. But again, to be fair to Peter, of course you don't get it. Uh, this is not something that's part of your world. This is something new. Well, some, something we need to look at somewhat in depth is Mark chapter 13. This is a rather long chapter. I will just go through some of it with you. I just want to highlight a few things for you. <clears throat> 
Mark chapter 13 has been given the title by scholars, The Little Apocalypse. We'll come back to this when we talk about the historical Jesus, but this is a, a great example, Mark 13, of Jesus being a good Jewish apocalyptic prophet. In this passage, Jesus is talking about ostensibly the end of the world, the end of the space-time continuum. He's doing this in metaphor because he's doing this in code because that, that's how you do this. It, you, you, you aren't being literal when you say things like the sun is going to darken, the stars are going to fall from the sky. That, by that, you just mean that things are going to change or destruction is coming. Right at the beginning of Mark 13, and this plays into to how scholars date the Gospel of Mark, there's this fascinating story. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings? And Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, when will this happen and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus said to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do, do not be alarmed. All of this has to take place, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. Um, this almost sounds too good to be true, but for historians... This sounds like Jesus or this sounds like Mark has put into the mouth of Jesus a prophecy about the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70. The armies that surround the city. The temple being destroyed. It's as if Mark as an author wants to say, look, Jesus Jesus foretold all of And again, this is one of the reasons why scholars think that Mark is later, certainly uh, at least 70, because Mark seems to know that this event has occurred because he puts it in the mouth of Jesus. Now, the other thing you see in this chapter is you see this whole thing about the desolating sacrilege that probably refers to something the Romans did to the Jewish temple when uh, they captured Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. What, what you typically do, just like Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes did, is you desecrate the temples of your enemies, the temples of those you've conquered. Uh, that, that's, that's probably what uh, verses 14 and following are all about. So again, it, it looks like Mark is taking current events, contemporary events, and he's putting them back into the life of Jesus uh, 30 years before these things uh, have happened. And then you get, and this is all coming straight out of the Old Testament book, Daniel, especially Daniel chapter 7. Starting in verse 24, you get... Jesus saying, but in those days, after that suffering, and this is very apocalyptic language, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. That just means there's going to be great destruction. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels. He will gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Now, if you go back and you read Daniel chapter 7, it's, it's clear that um, Mark's Jesus is, is 
comparing himself to that son of man figure in Daniel 7. And in early Christian tradition, uh, there's a very similar passage to this one in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, one of Paul's letters. In early Christian tradition, this became known as the parousia in Greek. It's in my notes, P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. And this often refers to what Christians even today call the second coming of Jesus. The coming of the Son of Man is the return of Jesus to the earth. It's the return of um, Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It's the final coming of the kingdom of God. Well, what's strange about this is Mark then does something that's baffling because he gives two timetables for this. Maybe he didn't realize he did this. Maybe he needed an editor or something. But he then starts talking about, he has Jesus talk about the fig tree, starting in verse 28. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its, its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he, referring to himself, is near at the very gates. And then Jesus tells his followers that are listening to him when this is going to happen, when the Son of Man is going to come back. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Now, if you stop right there and you read this, you go, okay, th there's a major problem here. Because Jesus is basically telling either his first followers back in the 30s, or this is being directed to Mark's hearers in the 70s, that Jesus will be back while they're still alive. This is also something that uh, Paul thought and talked about and talks about, I should say, uh, often in his letters, especially his early letters, that he will see Jesus come back. Now, the problem with this is that all of us know Jesus didn't come back. But then Mark, to, to make this as convoluted as possible, goes on and in verse 32 has Jesus say, but about the day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you don't know when the time will come. It, I mean, it's, it's almost here as if, if Mark has just taken all these different traditions and can't decide, well, is he coming back now? Is it later? Is it when is it? And just patched them all together. And what happens is this creates a nightmare for historians trying to decide, well, did Jesus say it's really, really soon? Or is it delayed? Does nobody know? Well, regardless of what's going on with that, Mark's overall message, even here in Mark 13, is one of suffering. And the idea is that things are going to get much worse, not just for Jesus, but even for his followers, before they get better. This is what happens throughout Jesus' life. In the gospel, this is what happens at his death. Remember, his last words, which are not his last words, especially in Luke or John, they are, it is his last words in, in Matthew, are simply, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So what Mark seems to be trying to tell his hearers and us as readers is that even though Jesus suffers and even though he dies, he really is the Messiah. But remember, nobody's heard that before. But what he's doing is he's flipping this. He's trying to say, yeah, what, what we didn't understand is the true Messiah doesn't conquer the true Messiah suffers. And that's how he wins. In other words, to, to use kind of an old uh, evangelical phrase, it's 
glory comes after suffering, is what Mark's trying to tell people. Now, Jesus in this gospel is a very, very, very human Jesus. We'll eventually contrast this with the gospel of John, the latest gospel written, where Jesus doesn't seem human at all. But here's a Jesus in Mark that's rejected by the people that are closest to him, his family, his followers, his religious leaders. And if you read the gospel closely, this is a, an individual who experiences doubt and pain before he dies. And like I said, keep this in mind because that picture of Jesus is going to slowly start changing. But remember... If you're living 2,000 years ago, the only Jesus you may have, may have heard of is Mark's Jesus. So it raises this question. If you just had Mark, who's Jesus? Who would he be? What does, if you want to modernize that question a bit, what does Christianity look like if there's just Mark? Let me talk very briefly about the different endings of Mark. There's a shorter ending of Mark, and there's a longer ending of Mark. These are texts that were added by scribes, Christian scribes, uh, well after uh, Mark was written. Part of why these texts were added is because people who started reading Mark realized they didn't like the ending of Mark. They don't like the fact that Mark ends with, so they, the women, went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So you get this shorter ending to Mark, which tries to clear some of this up. And all that had been commanded them, and they told briefly to those around Peter, and afterward, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. What this shorter ending is trying to say is the women fled, but they then went and they talked to Peter and they talked to the other disciples. And then Jesus shows back up and tells the disciples to go proclaim the gospel. But then you have this much, much, much longer ending to Mark. I'm not going to bother reading all of it. Um, but the, again, this was to try and make sense of, of a bizarre ending to a gospel. But there's this line in Mark 16 that says, and they will pick up snakes in their hands. This is verse 18. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. That little passage, because... People, uh, there are people that simply read the uh, King James version of the Bible, which doesn't have, um, which doesn't point out that this isn't original to Mark, led to a phenomenon in American Christianity uh, that's uh, centered in Appalachia, around Tennessee, parts of Kentucky, and in West Virginia, known as snake handling Christians. What these Christians do is they, uh, during their worship services, will bring out poisonous snakes. And because of this passage, they use the snakes as a test. If you get bit by a snake and you survive, it means you must be one of the true faithful. You must be one of the elect. If, however, you get bit by one of these snakes and you die, then you must not be a true follower of Jesus. Now, I'm not going to go too deeply into this. You can Google all kinds of things about this and watch... Um, video on it even of, of this going on. It's, it's quite bizarre. Um, one of the interesting problems that this has caused is, is snake handling protected under the uh, First Amendment? Is it freedom of religion? Is it freedom of speech? Uh, some courts have ruled yes, some have not. That gets really tricky uh, if a child uh, dies while handling one of these snakes. Uh, but uh, again, this has nothing to do with the Gospel of Mark, but uh, you should be aware that sometimes texts like this one uh, 
take on a life of their own and do things that the original author never intended them to do.